Da, da, da. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Nerdist Book Club. We are live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. My name is Rachel Hine, and joining me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, Hector Navarro and Maude Garrett. <laughs> I almost did the name swap thing I did a million years ago where I said I Hector Garrett and Maud Navarro, but then I didn't, but then I said it anyway. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I miss your faces. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> before, we, before we dive in, because we, we have uh, many opinions to share and maybe some clarifications uh, from the reading this, uh, this month, but to everyone who's joining us at home, Thank you for joining us. If you're new to Nerdist Book Club, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know some of your favorite books or what genres you love to read. We meet once a month. We have met weekly in the past, um, but we're Nerdist Book Club, exactly what it sounds like. And we've been doing this for since 20, end of 2016. So wow. quite, quite some time. Hold up. Are we coming up to our technically fifth year anniversary? We are because wow. it's October. Wow. Next month. Wow, that's I mean, great. That's half a decade we've been talking books together. That's, that's so, so great. Cool. I know, I love that. Um, yes, please, and uh, Hector and Maude, if you will help me in the chats to call out everyone who's saying hello because we we miss each other. We were just saying right before <laughs> this started that uh, we miss each other and we miss y'all and we love talking <laughs> about books with you, even uh, if... <laughs> we don't always love the reading. So tonight <laughs> uh, we're talking about some classic science fiction, um, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, the original trilogy as it was published in the 1950s. Before we dive, ooh, those are interesting they're covers. Really nice are those, covers. oh, those mm. are the Apple TV show. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I, listen, I, I wish Lee Pace was on the cover of these books. He's not. Mm, same. So I have to I have to settle for a little Apple TV that's not a sticker. Oh, it's just like on the cover. Water. Yeah. Guys, I didn't even watch the show. Oh, whoa. So I didn't we're, do it. we're we've we've got lots of thoughts and feelings yeah. going on. And we want to know how you all felt in the chat. Let us know. Have you read these before? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Why? Why not? Because we're going to get right into it. But I just want to do a quick recap for those who uh, are just joining us about what we're reading. So the Foundation series written by Isaac Asimov, who was considered one of the most important science fiction writers of his generation. He wrote in the 40s and 50s, all the way up to the 80s, I believe. And similar to other iconic science fiction novels from this era, his famous works were actually published mostly as short stories and then gathered into a published book, which you can tell when you read them. Uh, Asimov wrote <laughs> hard science fiction though, um, which is very different from some of the pulpy science fiction that we've read on this show from the same uh, time period. And crucially, I think, the foundation, the first kind of stories were inspired by the history of the decline and fall of the Roman empire, which is a uh, nonfiction accounting. So let's get into it. Did you, first question for everyone, did your copy come with the introduction that sort of explained what Isaac Asimov was going for? And let us know in the, in the chat as well. Maud, you're shaking your head. No, I, I had the audio book. So the narrator was fantastic. I really dug it. I was on 1.4, 1 1.5 the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, is there physically in the books, uh, is there redacted portions? Is anything redacted? What do you mean by redacted? Like you're trying. Oh, to they stop. They stop in the middle out. of a sentence, or uh, I I guess, but only whenever you get little entries for the Encyclopedia Galactica at the beginning of a chapter. For example, here they'll start. You know, they'll start reading a thing, and then it just goes ellipses dot 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 Encyclopedia Galactica because it's it just takes a chunk of this fictional. Yes Encyclopedia, no, yeah. There would be words missing, and I huh. thought that it was like a government sort of document that had been that had redacted sections in it that were actually blocked yeah. out. So the records had been very 1984. The records mm -hmm. had been sort of altered with because there were just 
words that were missing in the sentences. So that was, was it were, was was the CD you were listening to skipping mod? Was that the no. issue? Okay. No. Weird. Yeah. I did, did see that in the pair. <laughs> Well, let's let's see. So not the three of us, none of us had read this series before in the chat. We're seeing folks say that Phil Donaldson says that um, they spent one of their favorite New Year's Eve finishing the third foundation book. Um, cool. James Rice tried to read the foundation, uh, but it was a little difficult, but is liking the TV show so far. Um, and Star Pilot Six was fairly met about them before. Um, and got a little bit more interesting during the mule parts, but that's about it. So, mm -hmm. I like this 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 comment from Erica. Uh, Erica Leal says, "No intro in the Barnes and Noble trilogy hardcover. That's a gorgeous mm -hmm. hardcover, mm -hmm. and I almost blind bought that years ago, and instead got these little little paperback boys when I went to Barnes and Noble a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm gonna be." Uh, uh, giving these away. I am not going to be holding on to this. <laughs> that's uh, that's like will. a step beyond not liking it. You're like, get these out of my house. I don't want them in my house. I have <laughs> precious space already. So, um, but that's, but I was curious about that edition because the Barnes and Noble edition, sometimes they take, I mean, they did even with John Carter. They took like the first five John Carter books and put that in that really nice, like, mm -hmm. you know, leather bound. It looks like a Bible with the gold leaf on Rich the side Mahogany. yes uh oh, lohit says actually rented this book from my school library in grade four did not understand any of it absolutely too young absolutely. my god super what, fair what what, do you, what 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 is a minimum age do you guys think that people should be before they try tackling this i say 54? minimum like 15 54. 16 years old 54 years old okay <laughs> I mean, yep. you might, whatever age you are when you actually really enjoy boring history, because <laughs> this felt like <laughs> this felt like um, those educational tapes that you would have to listen to, like when you're going around the museum. Yeah. This is what I pictured. Griffith mm -hmm. Observatory with all the galaxy there and you walk up to it and it's like, this is Trantor. Trantor was created in the da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. And then it cuts to like a play where people speak about it to each other. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, like the little kind of like the animatron. Well, mm -hmm. there's actually that's so funny because it's published in. Am I echoing for anyone else? No, that sounds good. Okay, good. Um, so in uh, we read a few years ago the Martian Chronicles, which is one of my favorite books, and you would think that I would like the Foundation because they're similar in terms of. They're similar on, I'm not gonna say it actually in a British accent, but on paper, like someone on Love Island would say, where it should check all the boxes. You know, they're, they were science fiction short stories in the 50s. Um, they have a little bit of that like cheeky, but like very, very dry humor in some places. Mm -hmm. um, but I just couldn't really follow this one. But in the Martian Chronicles, there is a whole short story where there is almost a museum that tells the story of how they got to Mars and why books were burned. And it's these kind of animatronic, you know, what? 1950s style robots telling that. And yeah, I, really that's quickly, fun. Game Wizard has been almost verbatim saying what I have been telling friends about this book. And that was that I don't know if anyone's played Mass Effect, but like the galaxy will go out and you can go to, from planet to planet and there will be like this glossary. Sometimes it's, an, you know, so it's but this is like an audio glossary of that. That is exactly 100% how I've been describing this. I just didn't know if anyone had played Mass Effect, but that's 100% what it is. So, yes, we're on the same page completely. Why do and you did guys I read think any of that or care about it in Mass Effect? Yeah, no. If it wasn't what? pertinent to the mission, pertinent, then I wouldn't do it. Why do you guys think that uh, we couldn't connect to this book or books? Is it because oh, of the writing why. style? Why? Why do you think it was for you, Mod? I'll tell you why. So okay. you, the best, most interesting part of the first book is the mm -hmm. concept. It, I was really on board with it. Harry Seldon has um, used mathematics to predict the future because history repeats itself. I mm -hmm. really dug that. And then we skip forward. So mm -hmm. we no longer have any ties to any characters that kind of set off that. Harry Seldon's pretty much like a, um, a projection at this stage moving forward. Mm -hmm. We keep jumping in time. We have no 
foundation uh, to which the characters, like any characters that I care about that can see us through this narrative. And they kind of do a bit better in book two where it's more of a character sort of, um, you know, it's anchored by Focus. two characters. Yeah. But the I think the damage was done in that first book where you had nothing to latch on to. It was information dump. And mm -hmm. then the fact that 90% of this book is dialogue means that there's no ebb and flow and there's no way to kind of see or picture what's happening because they're just spoken word. It, yeah, it was tough for me. I'm going to echo that and say that it was tough for me to um, – to 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 kind of follow the rhythm of the story because it would boil down to like okay here's the next scene which is two men having a conversation and then when that scene's over guess what's next <laughs> another, another two men having a conversation and it went on and i st that i started to then realize and look i love old pulpy stuff i love comic books i love superheroes and so much of that crap is full of men characters it's 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 and to a point where so much of my blinders i sometimes don't notice that stuff and while reading foundation even the first book i could not help but notice i'm like where are the women at where are the other types of characters in this story and i started to feel like isaac asimov number one he's just not interested in characters which is fine like that's 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 the writing style and that's the story building style of this of this like trilogy or of this, you know, series. Cause he goes and does prequels and sequels and everything. So the whole thing, including I robot, which I haven't read, but I don't know if it'll be a different style or the same style. And then number two, I just felt like Isaac Asimov who has such an interesting idea. Like mod said for this first book, the premise is one of the greatest sci-fi premises ever. I'm like, Oh, Isaac Asimov doesn't know how to write anything other than men having a conversation. And, and so he's seeing the whole story through that lens you know, and I'm like, that's kind of a bummer because there's got to be interesting, you know, again, think about your other classic uh, mod mentioned Mass Effect. I can think about Star Wars. Imagine if Star Wars was just politicians talking and now you know why people didn't like the prequels. The prequels. Imagine if, if Star Wars... The, the, trade, yeah, the trade the trade dispute. The, the, if, the, yeah. if the whole story was told through men and politicians having conversations and talking about, you know, the chosen one out there and talking about Darth Vader over here and it's just like, well, why? I want to spend time with them. And I think just that's why... Stupid. Book two was what, or at least I think that's why a lot of people's favorites, and I know Matt Karen may be able to confirm this in the chat. A lot of people's favorite character in the Foundation, you know, franchise is the Mule, because that's when Isaac Asimov was like, "Let me do some character work here, and you're going to spend some time building up the Mule, and then once we get to the Mule, it's like very interesting and different." And he was very interested himself by the Mule, but then when the Mule went away again, because it's a time skip. I, for the third book, in the third book, when that was over, I was like, oh, now I'm not as interested anymore. Anyway, what were you going to say, Maud? Um, because only because you brought up Star Wars, we are talking about um, science fiction here. And, and the point that, you know, we were talking about was that there's just too much dialogue. This should have been a stage play. It would have been a lot better received if it was a stage play, although it would have been a 19-hour <laughs> play. Um, what I will say is there were a few standout words and world building in this, which I think Star Wars or George Lucas was like, yoink. 100%. Absolutely yeah. borrowed from June. We covered that a lot when we covered June for six weeks. For this particular one, we are looking at the empire, a galactic empire. There were the form of currency were credits. Mm. Um, there An were, outer rim of, of, mm. of planets. You know, all um, of this happening at the outer at the outer rim of the Federation. The mule was a Wookiee. So, I mean, obviously he... <laughs> no, the mule off. was kind of a Jedi. Like a bad <laughs> Jedi, but like... Yeah, yeah the mind some powers. Of the mind, you know, some of some of that. And I, I do, I agree. Oh, that's it. That's it. There oh, were yeah. six as measurement as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was also one other thing, which was a... Um, a the name of some sort of key political figure. It was the same in Star mm. Wars as well. Like oh, a Viceroy? And maybe. Viceroy or Chancellor yeah. or also, Viceroy? Tr the, the biggest example for me was that Trantor, the main city in the middle of the galaxy, 
uh, the main planet rather was a huge city was all a city. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's Coruscant. They yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. just lifted that. You know, yeah. we just read uh, Light of the Jedi, the High Republic, and they talk about how there's barely any vegetation on Coruscant, even then, too, you know. And so I was getting those same vibes. I'm like, oh, yeah, we just we just we just spent some time in that sci fi concept. And now here we are again. This is the originator. We should absolutely give credit to and understand, like, where all yeah. that stuff came from. So it's interesting for sure. And uh, in the chat, that Matt, Matt Karen guy, our number one Dune fan, is relating uh, also how Foundation ties in with Dune. And I think you both are absolutely right in terms of why we maybe didn't connect with this book as much. Um, and folks who are Foundation fans in the chat are explaining to that, you know, much like many of these authors, they didn't know that some of this work was going to become what it became. And there's apparently an alternate reading order that you could check out and there's more character development in, in the prequels and the sequels that we didn't cover. Uh, but I think also there are lots of different types of readers and we've talked about this through many different, you know, books and genres on this show where we, I think a, the three of us, even though we can disagree in terms of different genres and which stories speak to us, we are very motivated by character work, um, and you know plot is important for especially i think for the enjoyment that we get out of a lot of sci-fi stories but but no some smoochies. Hmm? there were no smoochies there were no smooches mm. zero mm. smooch mm. zero mm -hmm. zero times i wanted anyone to smooch really <laughs> because i wanted whoever was hunting the mule to just a yeah. hopeful smooch if i must mm -hmm but there was no time for it. No, but I do think that- The show does have smooches, Nerdist, thank you. The show has smooches, yes. That's yes, an incentive. I, that is incentive. Um, and I love Jared Harris and Lee Pace. Um, but I do, I feel like some, a lot of the theoretical um, stuff and what you loved about the first book mod, some, a lot of people find, I think more scientifically minded people maybe <laughs> find a lot of enjoyment in that. And I'm just wondering, for those in, you know, on Twitch, on Facebook, on YouTube right now, if you are a huge fan of the books, are you also really into like hard science or did you read it at a certain time? I would love to know mm -hmm. what people love about it and maybe it's the whole series. Um, really quick, I yeah. just note, note uh, David Grover's comment is really, really great. The writing is more akin to classical history like Herodotus, mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying the second one or Gibbon. The challenge of reading this as popular fiction is justified. How do you say it? Uh, that would be uh, Thukydides. Thukydides? No idea. Maybe? I'm guessing. Um, and Gibbon. Thucydides. 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 Yes, I know. I just clipped that part out. Um, <laughs> But I will also say, oh, I just lost. Oh, Sorry. Gibbon is who wrote or co-wrote, I believe, uh, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which is mm. dry. Mm -hmm. And so you, I think if you, I started listening to this first and just couldn't, couldn't follow it um, mm -hmm. for those who are new. I have a hard time picturing in my mind's eye. It's called aphantasia. If you also, <laughs> like a better call Saul, if you also didn't realize that people were visualizing sheep to count when they couldn't sleep, look up aphantasia. You might have it um, and are clumsy. But I switched <laughs> to the ebook and was really glad that I read that intro that kind of shared some of that inspiration from uh Asimov because that made that kind of primed me a little bit better for what this is, which is definitely not like a deep character piece. Mm -hmm. Are you guys ready for how do you say it? Yes. Yeah. Let me know if you can hear this. Say or that not. again. Let me know if you can hear it. Thucydides. 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 Oh, that sounds fun. Thucydides. Thucydides. Wow, I think I think that that is a, a totally valid uh, reading of the material is to say like it's done in the style of historical um uh information or you know uh, uh the history like real life history or whatever but i also feel like while reading it that asimov himself is trying to 
do popular fiction, is trying to tell a story that is engaging with characters. Because, because if not, why wasn't the entire thing done in the style of excerpts from the Encyclopedia yeah. Galactica. You know what I mean? Which I'm like, that would have been an interesting experiment if Asimov did have this whole thing mapped out and was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give the readers pieces from an actual encyclopedia treating it mm -hmm. as though it were. But he's writing scenes with characters where they're right, conversing right. and talking and he's and he's world building. And and I know that in 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 the back of each of these little books that I've got, it talks, it has a little like about the author and it's like, he started this at the age of 21. Not realizing it, which is like, that's crazy. I wasn't smart at age 21. I'm still not this smart today. And, and I just a, turned 34. Too. 30. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? For tw a 21 year old scientist, a kid who just turned the age to drink, maybe the, the legal age was different back then. I don't know, whatever. But I think it was. very, very impressive. And, and, and I am cutting him slack knowing like, well, you didn't know this was going to be an Apple TV plus show someday. <laughs> like you, like you, let alone. <laughs> you know, that it was going to influence as much as it did, because I think if he knew that, I think he would have treated it more like Tolkien treated the Lord of the Rings books or, you know what I mean? Or even George Lucas treated Star Wars. Like they really cared and crafted about that, the, 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 the sort of how to pitch the story. And I think that he, I think that Asimov was dabbling in that, but he was also like, you know, doing, doing it the way that he was interested in. So, um, yeah, but I do think it's valid to be like, to just let everybody know up front, yo, this is dry. Somebody responded to me on Twitter. They're like, "This is bu these books are so dry. You have to read them like when you're in the middle of the ocean. Like that's how they, that's how dry they are, which I thought was well, real funny. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think this sort of this comment is is illustrative of I think the point because even though we disagree often, I think we are looking for a little bit pulpier of a work. I love to what Game Wizard said. Um, it felt like Frank Herbert took the framework of foundation and made it better in Dune by adding actual drama and focused on characters. And over one, obviously, it's over at least the first book. Mm -hmm. Matt, don't yell at me. <laughs> My, um, I really, I really like the part, though, where that's borrowed, like the whole notion of predicted and um, manufactured and manipulated future. So mm -hmm. it's like we are going to predict what's happening and we're going to start laying the foundation to map out that path so that we have a say on what it looks like. Yeah. So the fact that um, Harry Seldon has basically prepared a, um, I was going to say diatribe, but like, you know, a, an actual study which depicts a whole what theory of doing belief for yeah. thousand years. And it's like it acts as almost like, and I would kind of love that where it's like, okay, it's September 29th. Oh, I should be right here doing this particular thing. Like kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing sounds a little bit nice, but is it sort of like avoid, like is it taking over free will? Can you predict everything? Yeah. The so, meal counteracted that. Hmm. So let's, let's dive into the books themselves a little bit too, because I noticed something this time that I think has colored our discussions of other books and I didn't realize it. So when I'm compiling notes for the episode, it's it's almost like I'm reading it again with like more, you know, so my first reading is my actual reaction to it. But then by the time I get through the notes, I'm like, ah, oh, conceptually that's really, so I think I got more into it and had to remind myself it was a struggle to, get through these just for my enjoyment. But I do think the ideas are super, super interesting and going back and kind of seeing how it all ties together. That made me enjoy it more retroactively. Um, help us, help us Rachel. <laughs> so I will. Um, so we'll, we'll start with founding. Well, first of all, Hector, you were saying earlier about the titling of the three books. Yes. <laughs> what do you think about those? Uh, I think, Dude, again, did not know that this was going to be this scrutinized. Uh, but once you actually do read the stories, it does make logical sense. The first one is foundation. The second one is like in the second or the next stage of this development of this society, what is the foundation going to have to deal with? The empire as it's crumbling. Mm -hmm. So the second one is called foundation and empire. The third mm -hmm. one is, well, what's the next chapter of that story going to be? Well, the secret hidden you know, uh, kept in the shadows, second foundation. 
if the first one were to fail and the first one does get taken over by the mule in that second book. So the third book is called Second Foundation. It all makes sense if you read it, but looking at the titles, I'm like, <laughs> this, it's funny. It, it, and, it could have been foundation, second foundation, third foundation, but that's not well, what the story technically is. Technically that would, yeah, no, technically, would I don't sense. know. Maybe, maybe there is a third <laughs> one, but uh, <laughs> the first book foundation is told in five parts. Um, so right. those were, most of those were published short stories, but we have the psycho historians, the encyclopedists, the mayors, the traders and the merchant princes. And this tells the story much like the other books as well of a future galactic empire's attempt to survive and rebuild over many, many generations beginning with the mathematician Hari Selden. And so as the galactic empire is nearing collapse, Selden spends his life developing the theory of psychohistory, this new mathematical sociology that predicts the future of civilizations. And Selden predicts the imminent fall of the empire for a 30,000 year long dark age before a second empire arises. So he can't really stop what's already in motion, but he does design this future where that dark age only has to be a thousand years. The committee of public safety arrests Selden and another mathematician for treason. But when he explains his theory, they decide to exile him to a remote world terminus to create the foundations Two groups of scientists and engineers put at opposite ends of the galaxy. So you think, <laughs> working um, to preserve knowledge and create a compendium of all human knowledge, the Encyclopedia Galactica, which is like, that's the premise, theoretically, of the first book. Mirrors, baby. Mm -hmm. um, and that newer think... section was not published as a short story um, before it was written after the rest of the book and written to introduce those other mm. stories when the first one was published, which I found interesting. That's the best part. Wow. I think, th I think also that the entire premise is my journey with the premise was very interesting too, because at first I was a hundred percent on board. And then the more I started to read this, the more I realized I'm like, this is science fiction designed before the internet was a thing, which is mm, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whenever sci-fi people are like, here's what the future will be, but they had no idea about the internet. I'm like, oh, you were so off. It's funny. And the more I started to read the story, the more I felt like, no, you know what? I think that the internet is a Pandora's box. And, so, and once it's been opened, it's opened. And I feel like the connectivity between people will always be a thing, even if we go to other planets, right? Because isn't there a thing where like, you can just download the internet onto another massive, I don't know, like hard drive or something. And when you go to Mars, it's the same internet there. Is it, or is it going to be a different internet with different web pages that don't load because it's like those only exist on Earth? And then, so I, I just, I just kept thinking about the logistics of that, and I was like, I just don't buy that people would become so disconnected that, um, that th they would lose the, you know, we don't know where me uh, people came from. We don't know, you know, all that kind of stuff. The other thing I thought was really interesting is that the, the whole premise is also incredibly cynical because Asimov is saying there's going to be 30,000 years of a dark age, but because of the people that could predict it, they're aware of it. But listen, there's still going to be a dark age, but they're going to make it only 1,000 years as opposed to like a different take on the story, which would be they're trying to prevent it altogether. They're trying mm -hmm. to stop the fall of the galactic empire and save as many lives. No, no, no. From the beginning, the story is like, there's this is going to happen no matter what. The best we could hope for is a shorter amount of time versus 30,000 years, which is still astronomical. and It doesn't really matter to an individual human's life. A mm -hmm. human born in that thousand year dark age is still going to have a worse quality of life than once the second empire begins and everything is better, I guess. So I think it's very interesting and very cynical, but there's a lot of realism to it. As I'm reading it, I'm like, it feels like the way that people now talk about climate change where it's no longer like we can prevent it, but it's more like we're going to, we, mm, we got to, <laughs> we're uh, all it's, depressed and it makes so bad. much yeah. sense that we yeah. are. But no one in this planet is thinking a thousand years ahead. At best we're thinking a yeah. hundred years ahead. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. We're so short sighted into, and it's so much about the now and the convenience of now that, I mean, it was refreshing to be like, wow, you guys are talking in thousand year blocks. Cool. That is not us. Yeah. I will yeah. say though, it's really interesting, Hector, that you said how um, cynical, cynical, cynical it is. The third book, I mean, obviously the word foundation was incredibly overused and I <laughs> um, plan to do the same throughout the course of this hour. 
Uh, but the number one word used aside from foundation in this book was sardonic, sardonically. Mm -hmm. Every fucking piece of dialogue <laughs> was said sardonically. And it's like he copy and pasted it. Like it got to the point where I was like, let me guess, this sounds a little sardonic, is it? And he was like, he said sardonically. And I was like, this is why I'm an alcoholic because I drink every time. <laughs> sardonically is mentioned. Yeah, yeah. it's I <laughs> I also, you know, to what you were saying, Hector, about um, it being cynical and thinking about the internet and interconnectivity, Clever Girl pointed out as well, and I know we all know this, but television was still kind of cutting edge at the time. Yeah. So thinking about that, but also, you know, book one, as as you sort of mentioned with the titles, but I feel like book one is is the rise of the foundation and sort of them figuring out what levers of influence to use to survive and outlive the empire. That's sort of book one is like, mm -hmm. how do we even become a contender in this fight? And the second one is fighting that out. And then the third one is really sort of this internal struggle between the two foundations as we're learning about it. But what I liked about the first one, especially going back through everything, was looking at how science, religion, and, you know, economics can be used to control a population and manipulate them. And there's levels of, of manipulation, ultimately, <laughs> <laughs> ultimately you know the uh the science of what selden selden is manipulating the whole thing through different people but they're also in order to stay in control completely using the priests for example which date you can compare that to actual human history and how religion was used as a means to sort of control these empires Christianity being made the religion in mm -hmm. in the Roman Empire was more so to unite under one umbrella than anything else. Um, we saw it in Shadow and Bone. Like mm -hmm. it's a really big thing. And yeah. again, it's like history repeating itself, isn't it? And it's like it pops mm -hmm. up a lot of the time in books because religion does play a large role. I'm done speaking. Because I'm not an alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <said> sardonically. <laughs> nice name. Um, um, I, <laughs> so, <laughs> kill me. Um, <laughs> in the in the first book, once they started jumping around to different times, were you? I know this because we were on text chains about it. But were you? <laughs> frustrated how did you were there any parts of the first book that you did appreciate i'm sure there was i just forgot them all i <laughs> i i also think too that the, the thing i remember from reading them if you go to my goodreads i gave them all one star which is so mean i did i gave all three of these they books were, they were well written the word yes. the language it was like yes. i'm two and a half stars even though you can't do half stars from probably gonna drop it to two because i didn't enjoy okay. it at all the yeah guy, like the guy can write he had a really great plan. It just wasn't executed in a way that we as a modern reader were able mm -hmm. to yeah. absorb. Yeah. Uh, Clover yeah. Girl has been stating so much that, you know, uh, she grew up in the 50s and so she was so sort of used to this style of writing um, and that, yeah, I think it was like a, just being a part of that time. Is it the same with John Carter? Only in particular, like some particular ways of description, like with talking about women, et cetera. Yeah. There's a couple of parts in this book that were like that as well. But as far as yeah. his language and how he used it, like I was really quite, I, I really liked his language. I just, it's very sophisticated. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just, he just can't tell a story. And that's the thing. I think we're so yeah. used to storytelling. He had a story and he was getting everyone to tell it. Mm -hmm. But it actually impacted the storytelling when when was the first one published or the first book or the first 1953 53 so like you know what's funny is wait 1951 no, I think it's but he started writing the in, the 40s. in the 40s it yeah. what Maud was just saying too is is reminding me of i read the first james bond story by ian fleming and he wrote it in the 50s i think the mid to late 50s and then it was made into a movie in 1962 but the ian fleming 
thing is the same thing where it's like this dude is a old school dude. He comes from the time he comes from. Definitely a misogynist. Definitely a racist as well. But wrote in a way where it, w- it was probably very modern and stuff at the time. It feels older now. It feels old fashioned. But there was still like a classiness to it. You know, that in the same with Asimov, I'm reading these scenes and I'm like, this is sophisticated and classy, even if I don't love some of the descriptions, even if I'm not engrossed by some of the characters, and even if I am slowly like just like tapping out of this kind of, you know, the the way that it's just the the dryness and the boringness of it, it still is well written and competent and at times very sharp and sometimes it's funny. And it's just not the, you know, I don't know, but, 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 um, the James Bond Ian Fleming thing is the same deal. I remember reading the first novel and going, this is good. And then I'd get to another section and I'd be like, this is bad. And then I get to another section and go, no, this is good. He's a good writer. So (laughs) it's just, it's just all about looking at it with that contextual lens, which is very interesting, but I'm never going to read this again. Never. (laughs) To answer your question there, Rachel, a standout part of the first book that I really enjoyed was kind of, you know, using the premise of this man has predicted the future and then um, even predicting sort of like minuscule things happening. So when we get to the part, I believe with the prince, uh, oh my God, I think it was like a sieve going through. But, um, <laughs> the warlord uh, who's trying, yeah, and yes, and mm-hmm. he thinks he's like three steps ahead. But it turns out that the mayor or whoever was in charge at that particular time had used the priest, turned the priest against him, and mm-hmm. what looked like uh, being in a really, really sticky situation. They had so much information about and, and could predict how everything would go that they were able to set up sort of like second and third sort of um, backup plans or put plans into effect to always stay ahead. And I thought that in the first book that that was really, really cool where you're like, "Uh uh-oh, how are you going to get out of this one, buddy? This guy's trapped you in a room. Like you can't leave. He's he's declared war. What are you going to do? And he'd already prepared for this particular Mm -hmm. moment. Uh, And I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. That's probably the only It feels like we also read uh, many moons ago, um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I Mm -hmm. do feel like some of the excerpts and um, the building of the computer and that story is, if not direct spoof um, on foundation, definitely reminded me of that, of this. I can see that very serious like planning out of events and everyone around kind of following it blindly um but i also you know when we get into the second book i know both of you said at least the mule was more interesting to you it felt more grounded because we were having a conversation we a we were to- investing in a character mm-hmm. that lasted the entire book so we mm-hmm. were having sort of like um, you know, layered information being told to us. Um, and we were, I, I tried to say different words for foundation just then. I, um, just, I wrote it so many times in the notes. I was like, the second foundation and the f- third foundation of the foundation from the, the book foundation. <laughs> for the foundation. Yeah. Doesn't mean anything anymore. It no. doesn't, yeah, uh, the word, lost. I mean, the word. <laughs> It's lost its meaning. Game wizard. Hitchhikers felt like foundation performed by Monty Python. Um, It's true. Yeah. I I also think hitchhikers used the like little excerpts of stuff Mm -hmm. in a humorous way because it was so dry and so British to learn Mm -hmm. huge, important pieces of information in a little like aside that was like, by the way, this thing happened then. And this is what it was called. And this is what it was end of mm-hmm. excerpt and then you would yeah. go back to the story and you're like wait a minute what the wait hang hang on guys mm-hmm. that's hilarious that you're just going to give me that kind of information in a little encyclopedia galactica thing that'll come back late but that'll come, that yeah. often come comes back later or yeah. in dune we have sort of the um beginning sections that are reading from you know the religious the empress's diary wasn't it the yes the empress and the religious text what was the uh, Avery Adventurous just reminded me? I actually enjoyed the Mule Magnifico plot twist in the second one. I thought it was written really well. What was the Mule's code name again? What was the clown's name? Magnifico Excellenza. What was it? Wasn't it something like? Oh, somebody remind me because it was the most ridiculous I know, right now. name. Giganticus. 
gi- ma- Gigant- magnifico Gigant- <laughs> giganticus it was just like you get to that name and you go isaac buddy what are you doing there's, there's no <laughs> consistency here and it's so and it's so funny that that I'm just going to call him Isaac from now on, that Isaac's frame of reference for his world as he's writing this massively ambitious sci-fi thing is that he's like, well, there's a clown. And I'm like, why would there be a clown exactly. in this galactic, well, it's like you a know? Cult. It's it sort of a yes. 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 yes, yes, yeah, it is. Princes. It's a jester. It's a jester. But I was just like, we're really going to, we're going to slow yeah. the story down and spend that much time with a clown, dude. You're going to have a clown be one of the major characters. And then You're I exactly did. Right, because it's, it's using yeah. a very ancient sort of um, yeah. archetype, you know, of being in the court and there being a jester and then making it sort of sci-fi based. It, but it doesn't i'm like clowns aren't sci-fi to me it never translates for me it's the it's same as when it, it when 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 opera sort of as well or a space true history. i wish it was more of a space opera it is a space <laughs> it's not history. really a space opera it's it's yeah historical historical fiction in space mm-hmm. kind of but then somebody but from the I'm, drama club wandered into the museum and we we're like what are you doing here you're in, you should be in the drama you should be in the theater performing a, an opera why are you in the museum i'm trying to learn about the real life history of this thing it it also it just it's just the fact princes. that it's i felt that like it's, it made somewhat sense because i was thinking of them as gotcha. like like a like the French Revolution. I don't know the <laughs> French Revolution in space. I don't know, but I just yeah, I saw it. something that's gonna blow everyone's minds and maybe Go. take over. Magnifico, because I was looking up his name, is Jar Jar Binks done right? Yeah, Disgust. and and Game Disgust. Wizard says the mule felt like if Jar Jar turned out to be the emperor the whole time, which I'm like, again, on which paper that sounds he was real f- <laughs> yes, but also that's an internet meme joke because yeah. on 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 paper that seems very interesting and like, man, what a what a what a a blanket to be you know pulled out from under us. Wow, that would have gotten us so good. But if you actually think about that for a second, if you're watching Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. And by Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, George Lucas tells you that the actual evil is Jar Jar Binks. You would be like, "Boo!" You you would. It's dumb. It's so dumb. And but early, it's like, the theory that is that, that if they the did Jar Jar, that yeah. he was a clown, but still had some level of not the Jar Jar we know. Correct. But it, some, an interpretation something. that would be slightly different, but yeah. So exactly. Matt. And also Matt Karen in the chat said, so the clown disguise deceived you, Hector, like the mules plan all along. (laughs) It did for a minute, but it was not that long into the story where I went, we're spending so much time with the clown. He's like the (laughs) first character to have a first and last name. He's got to be the mule, right? (laughs) And and sure enough, he was the mule. I did predict it. And I don't know if it's, if I I knew because of pop culture osmosis, I'm not, I don't know. Maybe I did remember that, but I did. Yeah. The way that that goes, and this is, you know, very indicative of the storytelling side of things, if you are introducing sort of like a nemesis who's in like a part of this sort of massive group and then you only are introduced to one other character, it's Scooby-Doo, man. It's Scooby-Doo rules. Yeah. (laughs) Where it's like, you know, it's the hospital tendee or whatever, Mm -hmm. and then there's a... It's the Gee, only other character we've maybe, been introduced to. Yeah. Exactly. Who has any maybe, the, to maybe the villain is the only other person in town, Mystery Inc. How about that? <laughs> yes. That's what you have to assume. They're yeah, probably so, old. They're probably and, and, the old blank at yeah, the blank. The old blank yeah. at the blank. I also did feel like it was the... Uh, because, I mean, again, maybe then it could have been mind-blowing when, when the second Foundation book came out. But now I'm like, this is just the usual suspects. I've seen this trope so many times mm. where like Maude is saying, you describe a big, competent, you know, evil person and then a fool. Wouldn't it be a great twist if the fool just like got up straight and they're like, well, now that you've known my plan all along. Like, yes, <laughs> I've seen that before. And it's fun yeah. if it's yeah. done. You know, I'm- it's fun. It's fun. I was really uh, reading this book and I got it. So, Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, also folks in the chat who are a big foundation fans. Thank you for sharing this insight are sort of discussing how he based a lot of the sort of historical elements of the story um, on the aristocracy and on these kind of archetypes. So um, Mm. that's super interesting as well. And I think obviously I'm not 
an English teacher <laughs> anyone. But I do, I do think that there are a lot of really interesting kind of ideas that come up by the third book when we end up seeing the foundations kind of turn on each other and the plan within a plan. Um, so I just wanted to know kind of what your take, both of your takes and, and the chats on the idea of psychohistory is, does it, does it mean, I know I'm constantly bumping into things. What <laughs> do you have on your desk, Rachel? What is it? A, a Jenga tower? Okay. Everything. everything. <laughs> um, really quickly. I'm, I'm just I've just tripped stuck without even moving before. Like just I get standing. it. I get it. Before we get stuck into that really quickly, Eric makes a really, really great point, And that is, please remember that Asimov uh, using the jester archetype was groundbreaking at the time. You've had 70 years of pop culture copying. It. Oh, for sure. And the, 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 also real quick, the thing I was trying to say earlier was that even then when Asimov was writing this, I think even in my head, my understanding is I feel like circuses and clowns were even more common in everyday life than they are today. I'll give you the example. Whenever people study like the origins of superheroes, which are so everywhere in pop culture today. It's so fun to get to the point where you learn that like the Superman costume, the original costume was based off of a circus strongman. And it's like, there are no circus strongmen anymore. That's not a thing anymore. So that's, it's become so removed from the original idea that a superhero costume is now its own thing. It's a superhero costume. But in 1938, a superhero costume was just a circus strongman costume. Uh, it, you, okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's the same way where like Batman and Robin, Robin came from the circus. Dick Grayson was part of the flying Graysons. Even the name mm -hmm. Dick, nobody has the name Dick anymore. It's just Richard, but he came from the circus. You can't do a Batman and Robin story like that today without, in my opinion, Tr trying to figure out how to do a circus because there's no circuses today unless it's Cirque du Soleil. That's mm -hmm. like the only thing that survived from when was much more common where people would go with a, a traveling circus would come to your town, you know, uh, once a season well, or whatever. Is, right. So, one yeah. of the books that was up in the poll for what we're reading in October and just barely lost, but I really want to reread it because I haven't read it since I was a kid. <laughs> Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. Right, that is that is the premise that um, this eerie traveling circus. So I do think that in, you're right that, you know, the circus was part of the cultural zeitgeist at the time he was writing yeah. it. But I also think that the archetype and the reveal, totally. the, the, the specific storytelling as to what that commenter said. And we agree, we totally agree and, and acknowledge that it feels that way to us because we've experienced so much of this similarly when we read dune and we talk about star wars because we mm -hmm. you know grew up with something different that came after the fact so even though we know inherently that it came you know from these original sources it still feels you know we can yeah. we can hold both thoughts at the same time I, to your point to your question rachel i know i already kind of said it where i was like struggling with the idea uh the premise of of not being able to be to like forget history and to be so disconnected out in a galactic empire or whatever, I think is, is also part of Harry Seldon's plan. Uh, there's moral imp implications uh, of the psycho history, which is what you're asking about. Do we have free will who gets to use psycho history? Is there any point to life is if everything is predestined or predicted, those are fantastic questions. My take on it is I think I am interested in optimistic versions of this stories like star trek where star trek skips to oh well we have our shit figured out i love that i am enamored with that idea and i think that is it is it being sardonic that you're adverse to Maybe uh, like all the cynicism and i, I don't know i maybe maybe part of it maybe even if i believe deep 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 down that we can't really affect too much of sort of the course of human history and people are mostly dumb. A person is smart, but people are dumb, like Men in Black tells us. And everything is going to eventually end and humans probably won't even get to go to another planet or solar system or all of that fun stuff. It would be great. And I'll certainly never see it in my lifetime. I think I still am trying to like grab onto the hope that like, you no, know, an individual can make a difference an individual can inspire people to then inspire people to then inspire people to hopefully shift enough to make a difference. I'm inspired by young people 
online every day because young people more than any group are really sick and tired of all the bullshit. And, yep. you know, and I, and I feel like our generation is kind of in the middle because we were kind of raised a little bit before the internet, but then we had the internet, you know, we were kind of raised on TV, but you know, but then we had the internet, but young people today are like, no, I've had, I, I've, I've, I've been connected with every part of the world since I was born and you guys have royally screwed it up You've and we it real bad. Right. And whereas I think maybe our generation's a little we bit have of a little more you know, hope, I think too. Maybe, but, but we're in the there's a whole, there's a whole kind of disconnect there, but I do want to also say, uh, highlight game, what game wizard said. Cause I think yes, this is sort of what I, what I took away, which is that we have free will on this individual level, but the plan predicts how large groups and how they can act given a certain stimulation. So in theory, when people say that you should study history, so it doesn't repeat itself, this is what they're talking about. So like <laughs> in our world, if you've seen something happen over and over and over and over again, maybe time to change things up a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. know. What could she be talking about? But history mm. keeps repeating things. itself, doesn't it? That's yeah. But that's keep, and that's I think it's because we we have this sense that that at, or I guess as a group, we struggle to learn from our own history, even though yeah. we're told it's important. There is this level of individualism in many societies that obviously we're seeing where, excuse me, sir. Um, I don't know if you can hear my cat, but I, I do also think that having people in positions of power with this power and the way that in the third book, the second foundation is kind of able to reset everything because they've had their own mission this whole time. And they needed to get back to a place where the first foundation thought the second didn't exist so that they wouldn't come to blows. <laughs> and so is that is awareness of the future enough to change the predictions? And I think, oh, yes, I think that I, awareness, if you were yeah. told this is what's going to happen. Yeah. You change it. That throws something in the uh, mathematic. Mm. I don't know. I'm an, I have an English degree, but um, <laughs> the mathematical equation of how we get to those places. It um, provides a, a number of variables because instead of it just acting in its own natural course, you are giving knowledge mm -hmm. um, and insight. Uh, and I think what was the word that you said? Uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that then provides variables where it's like now that we know what it is what else can it be? And so it kind of adds like a spider web effect every single step of the certain path. Well yeah. said. But then if the, second like foundation, if the second foundation is making it so that the first foundation is not worried about it anymore because they think they defeated it, is the overall plan aware that that awareness of a second foundation. Are you following me? I feel yes. like I've got something <laughs> yes. that, that, that the awareness was already baked into that equation because that Had to have second been. foundation is the fail safe to. But interesting make... that the default is that they would be threatened by an additional foundation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the first thing that they think is we have to destroy it. Or is it the mule course. saying that we need to destroy it? Like what? But then the second foundation is well aware of the first one. And is there anything, you know, is there anything to the fact that besides that they get the answer of where the second foundation is totally wrong, that the first foundation is focused on physical sciences and the second is psychiatry and, and mm. you know, telepathy and psychic abilities. Yeah. Because why is the second one allowed? The second one's allowed to know of the existence of another one. Because instead of black and white, it's literally psychology. So yeah, that's what I thought was really true. interesting. Yeah. The introduction of mutant abilities, which I thought, you know, Hector, that would have absolutely kind of hopefully reeled you back into the story. Didn't like mutant, it. Mutant powers. But it is the consequence of having an entire organization, I will not say foundation, I fucking said it, <laughs> based on psychologists so what happens when mm -hmm. you have scientists in mm -hmm. one sort of uh what do you call them compound Foundation? one group no no i'm trying to use every other word so, uh, um, uh community community so when you only have scientists then you talk about sort of 
um, building atomic weapon, weapons, using your intellect. Mm -hmm. The fact that their second foundation is full of psychologists means that they were able to evolve to a point where they were able to understand emotion mm -hmm. and feelings on such a level that they could tune into it and manipulate it. That was probably the most fascinating part about these books. And I have a dog that I will pick up as well. And Hector, I will, <laughs> you're about to add in on that. But the last thing that I want to do, because we only have five minutes to wrap up, I Trench has said exactly my review, word for word, if we want oh, to pop what? that up on screen. Oh, I want to I see what trench. that was. Okay. Well, now I've got to scroll up. i got to keep scrolling. Oh, there it is. There bit. it is. And then you see I Trench's <laughs> I Trench. I'll read it. The yep. first, it's at 5.52 p.m. The first foundation book really isn't written very well at all. The beauty is in the concept, but the literary execution is horribly flawed. Not to mention, sans women. A hundred percent. You know what's yep. funny? I didn't like that there was mutant powers introduced into this sci-fi concept. I... They don't uh, deserve mutants. They, <laughs> they didn't get it, okay? No. <laughs> I think oh, that's sorry. fine, but it's for the same reason I didn't like the movie Looper. Directed by Ryan Johnson, who directed my favorite Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi. Looper is about time travel. But then it's also about a kid who's born with enough power that he can, like, has yeah. telekinesis. And it's, like, the first kid born. And and there is a comic book writer whom I follow on Twitter. His name is Dan Slott. And Dan has oh, talked about great. this. Where Dan Slott has talked about how he, he calls this thing in stories mojo. Where if a story has one particular type of mojo, you can't introduce another mojo into the story. Otherwise, it messes up. The story, for example, James Bond has never fought aliens because Mojo and James Bond is, it's a, it's a what spy. The well, movies? That's, that's a little tricky. That's a little different, but it's ultimately the Fast and Furious movies thus far have remained consistent in their ridiculous, exaggerated action spectacle Mojo. Other than the Hobbs and Shaw movie did introduce enhanced humans, but it was still kind of in a sci-fi... <laughs> It, it's, I gotta watch it's, that. yes, it did. Uh, uh, Hobbs and Shaw <laughs> did introduce that, which is wild. And it's maybe, you know, one of the, um, one of the reasons. Yeah. Technically, James Bond did fight aliens in Cowboys and Aliens. LOL. Yeah. Well done. But there's a, a story that has one mojo. You can't introduce another mojo, you know, otherwise it kind of it messes up the thing. Stick in your lane, than, I believe, is what you're trying to say. Yeah, Stay in your but, lane. But mm -hmm. even within like an omniverse, like the Marvel universe or the DC universe, which has, science fiction or grounded street level stories or or magic or whatever like it's all existing in the same thing it usually is what doctor strange is in his lane you know the avengers are in their lane mm -hmm. spider-man is in his lane until there's crossover stuff that's fun but it's it's usually it, 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 st it sticks to one thing looper I'm had gonna... the had the mojo of time travel and it introduced powers. And I feel like the same thing happened with the foundation books. It's like, it, you're, you're, you're telling me that the mojo is predicting the, the thousands and thousands of years of human development. And then to just introduce a character that has, uh, powers, powers that he was born with that has no basis in kind of human history or whatever, then it does go into a fantasy story. Right. So I, I, I that kind of messed with me a little bit. And I feel like it was in some ways it was almost a cop out as opposed to Isomov saying, well, there will be a person born who was also just as smart as Harry Seldon, figures it out, manipulate, you know what I mean? Like there could have been a different mm -hmm. path he could have taken to still maybe get to a character like the mule who like still takes over and conquers and stuff. Anyway, that's my little spiel. I can't wait to get into the after show because we got a lot more to talk about. Oh, that's what I, I was I going to shout out. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I just want to talk about the two quotes uh, that Isaac Asimov wrote about women in this book mm -hmm. that I really didn't like. Uh, the first comes from book two. Book two, there was a conversation and they were referring to Beta, which was the first, pretty much the first woman introduced to this series. Yes. And this man said, you can always tell how fat a woman is by her the top of her arms, <laughs> by her upper arms. Oh, my God. <laughs> you can always tell how fat a woman Dear is. Dear Lord by her and, upper arms. And Maude, when you said her name out loud, her name is Beta, not Alpha. She's the Beta. Come on. That's so messed up. What's the second quote, Maude? The second quote is talking about Arcadia. When introduced, there was some sort of agent who was trying to get and sneak into the house. Sneak third book. into the house. Third book. Mm -hmm. Sneak into the house. And she's there. And she basically threatens this man with a baseball bat because he has 
discarded a briefcase and tried to sneak through the window of her Mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. She's basically kind of detained him. And then her father, Torin, what's his name? Torin, uh, uh, who gives a shit? Yep. Um, When he comes in, instead of being like, well done, Arcadia, you are a strong woman that really handled this situation, he was basically like, how dare you? The men will talk now. (laughs) To which this man who tried to break into their house says, do you want to marry? And she's like, I'm 14. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he's like, do you think you'll eventually want to marry? And the father says, you know, we suppose she will. And he says, kill the man who who decides to marry her. Shoot him. Because shooting him will be a better existence than being married to her. (laughs) Guys, the Apple Plus show is much better than these books. Very interesting. I've seen the first two episodes. I've seen the first two episodes. Lots of changes, but there's some there's some core stuff that's that are in there, and it's very very interesting. So yeah, well, I recommend we it. will definitely talk more about the show, about 1950s sci-fi, all that jazz on the after show. One second, we will tell you how to join that. But first, we have homework for next week. We're going to a much more modern book, y'all. Um, and uh, Thank you to everyone who stuck it in for the Foundation Trilogy. If you didn't, that's okay, too. It's totally fine. Not every single book, obviously. We're not all going to love them. This one was uh, was harder for all three of us. But the next one that we're going to be reading is Grady Hendrix's The Final Girls Support Group. Um, so your homework is to read that whole book so you can join us live on Wednesday, October 27th at 5 p.m. Pacific, right here on Nerdist YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, all of the places, come join us. We will eventually read some of the other books on that list because I <laughs> wanted to. I want to read every spooky, spooky book that was on our poll. Um, but we also need new book ideas for November. So let's do another poll. Let us know what you want to read. Can be any kind of genre. Just make sure that you're sending that uh, your recommendations to hashtag Nerdist Book Club. If you're on Twitter, you can send us a Facebook comment, a YouTube comment, a Twitter comment, or you can join our after show community mod. What does that entail? We talk books 24 seven over on Geek Bombs Discord. If you want access to that, all you have to do is sign up for Geek Bombs Patreon. Any tier gets you access, even the $5 a month tier will get you access to hashtag reading. With that, you get access to the after show. This is not broadcast. You cannot find it anywhere else. This is a very intimate chat with all of us. We jump into the the Discord call and we like kind of do an audio Q&A. So you can ask your questions, we can have a discussion and we talk about the book of the month. Also, the first and second Wednesday of the month, we will be covering a separate book. We're going to go into the Dresden Files next month, uh, book number three, Grave Peril, which is a little bit of a palate cleanser (laughs) as far as I'm concerned. Uh, We're going to be going into that one. So if you read it or if you want to read it, this is the place to do it. The community is there. We absolutely love reading. A lot of the names that you're seeing in the chat during this show are a part of that community. Um, it's really wonderful. So we'd love to have you over there. And we're going to go there right now. Patreon.com slash Geekbomb if you want to get involved. Yep. Come join us. We're going to go talk more about this book, other things we're reading, and uh, get some more recommendations from y'all. So thanks for joining us this month. We'll see you next month for Spooky Season. And goodbye. Woo! Bye.